All right. Very good. Thank you so much for the invitation, and Catherine and John for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here, and I'm also really excited to be a part of the Climate Science Center. I'm very impressed with the truly interdisciplinary nature of this group, and that really inspired me to talk to you today about some of the experiences that I've had in working with international and interdisciplinary teams working on climate change research and education. And I want to share a little bit about my experiences. Obviously, you all know this, that climate change is just such a big question that we have to transcend those disciplinary boundaries. So it goes beyond those disciplines, but it doesn't always just happen automatically. Even if you get the right people in the room, there's this process that has to take place to answer those big questions. And uh, I want to share a little bit what I learned about that process and how I've been doing this by mapping. Mapping is one way that we can kind of make climate change really real, the real questions that we have about global climate change, but what is going to happen to me here where I'm at. So there's a sort of a natural ability to look at that question. And I want to share a little bit about what happened when I, when I did some of these projects. So uh, as I said, it doesn't just happen. You have to design for this. And uh, it, it's a parallel process that I've been using in looking at mapping as a process and collaboration as a process. So taking the group that the groups that I've been working through, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the design principles. There's plenty of academic literature and methodology and things behind this, but I'm not going to clutter this up. I want to talk about those principles that uh, really drive that kind of result. So mapping is a process, not just a product. And there now are technologies, GIS, as you know, can bring in different data layers from many different groups. But then what do you do with that when you interrogate, interrogate that process? Uh, it starts with asking, what scale are we operating at? Where are the boundaries? What gets included in the map? What doesn't get included in the map? And these are very similar processes for collaboration. Uh, these processes are people-driven processes, so in the work that I've done, I've paid a lot of attention to those so-called soft skills in addition to the geospatial, geotechnical kinds of skills, uh, and it turns out that's really important. Uh, people, really, oh, people really need to uh, understand what can maps do, and key among these soft skills is communication. This is a map that I really love to use <coughs> to show the power of communication in maps. Even if you're very familiar with the size of Africa, looking at it in this sort of sense gives you the powerful communication tool that maps can kind of provide. And so those are explicit processes that should be brought into those collaborations. Um, it's not always an easy process, and we have to define the roles of each of the mappers and with the mappers and the rules of the game. The key word here is with, and this is true whether you're um, using mapping as a uh, community mapping geography, community geography mapping with the stakeholders in the actual research process, or uh, just even among the collaborators themselves. So uh, those kinds of processes are very iterative. Uh, sometimes they deal with the technology, sometimes it's just old-fashioned, getting together, writing on the whiteboard, and doing the different groups. There's an idea marketplace that is sort of a mechanism that I like to use to try to decide what really goes into the maps, who is interested in what, and, and what's going to come into that process for a consensus purpose. But this is, a, this is a challenge sometimes to try to connect with each other around these kinds of ideas. So it's really important to create a sort of reflective environment for that collaboration to happen. And those, those kinds of reflections can happen through uh, simple things like journaling and uh, you know, with my students, so this is something that we always use I've also used it with researchers ourselves to be able to get to know actual research sites. This slide is very busy, but it's an illustration of a methodology that I said I was going to go academic, but there is um, a publication that colleagues and me have put together that's coming out uh, for the end of the year on how to take what is happening uh, with the, the researchers engaging with that research site, uh, codified in those qualitative uh, results and link them to the specific points, lines, polygons, the spaces of the research area. And so this is a process that as going through it, it kind of makes that whole thing visible and explicit to those who are working on the research area. Uh, it's really uh, important to do that and mapping helps us make those things visible and communicate with each other, especially now that we have these really amazing tools. We all are geographers now with our phones and the maps and the apps that go onto the phones. Uh, you can take them out like in the iPads into the field. It's 
That's what it looks like on your phone. You can actually see the dots point up when you're collecting the data, crowdsourcing data together in real time. They just pop up on your phone and you can see all the metadata, who's doing what, who's saying what, what pictures are they taking. These are the kinds of things that we can do now. Uh, also with um, working in the cloud, there's all sorts of uh, geographic information software, ArcGIS Online, even OpenStreetMap where everyone's working on the same data and the same database. And this is really, talk about collaboration, this is a really amazing kind of technology to be able to use. Um, finally, in terms of the design principles, I want to emphasize uh, taking risks. This is not always a guarantee for success. And uh, I keep learning this every time I do this over and over again. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to just talk about how these are the kinds of principles that have allowed me to create those spaces for facilitation, international exchange often. And, and really key is optimizing the participation and the synergy that can happen when you put different researchers from different fields together. So I wanna just go through three really quick examples of how this has sort of played out and in some of my favorite projects, recent projects, they're all favorites, um, in terms of how that enables research outcomes to be strategic and uh, more visible with not only stakeholders but also with the policymakers. And in, in the case of education projects, uh, accomplishment and exceeding the expectations for learning objectives. So the first example I wanna to give to you was funded by NSF this was a few years ago, on integrating climate change research with hazards researchers. The, this was sort of an idea that we had to, to across the Americas. So we had 11 countries, 50 scholars. There were about a dozen who were very well known and about three dozen who were early career scientists. And we had geographers, climatologists, communication scientists, engineering, urban planning, you name it, sociology, anthropology. It was definitely a challenge. And um, so we started mapping. Mapping is, is the process of visualizing this information, right? Whether it's uh, real space, conceptual space, and we did both. Uh, so at the beginning, we were really talking about climate change and hazards, and we couldn't hear all of these other things that was going on with that. So we broke up into different groups. Uh, one of the types of groups was North, North American scholars or the South American scholars. And through these, these kinds of uh, activities and writing out questions, what are the questions, the burning questions for you where you are, uh, we could see that in North America, obviously there was really a lot of discussion of hazards, but you see the keyword adaptation, this is very familiar. Uh, uncertainty, at least five years ago, that was really heavy in the discourse. Uh, but some interesting things happened with our South American scholars Latin American scholars, obviously the, the word adaptation is involved in there, but policies were really key to how their work on climate change was being uh, unfolding in the region. And you even see the word resistance there, I don't know if you can read that, but it was kind of an interesting development to how to map out these kind of conceptual spaces in real time during the workshop so we could talk to each other. Uh, obviously we also did this by discipline, the geographers were talking about data, uncertainty, communication scientists obvi obviously brought up the media, but they also were talking about opportunities, which brought a sort of different perspective that we actually could see. And uh, of course the engineers and planners talking about decision making and um, cities and, and some of the people there. So uh, as I said, it's big risk, sometimes it works. I wasn't sure that it was gonna work, but I love this picture because it was kind of a moment when we kind of all realized that we were going to do it and what we did was put together a research agenda with all of that work published in English and in Spanish which the next year was adopted by the OAS specialized organization uh, strategic plan for, for the next decade. So I think the reason why this was adopted was because we didn't have that jargon, we had a very comprehensive set of ideas that we really played off of each other, we had a process and we mapped out that process conceptually and over space. The second example I want to talk about was funded by NASA and USAID. Um, this is our, the most recent version of a global fellowship program. I just told you about a research program. This is sort of an integrated research education. In USAID terms, you would say capacity building. Uh, and there were 120 graduate students um, in 24 countries and in four different regions. It was open to all disciplines, and boy, we got them. So, <laughs> but the key, the key thing that tie, tied everyone together, they were proposing their own research in their own places. What does climate change mean to us here? 
And the key thing was that they would be using and learning about geospatial technologies and data from NASA to be able to do those things better with a heavy participatory component to it. Uh, we started off in East Africa, and the theme uh, emerged from climate change and food security uh, in that part of the world. And uh, we met in, in Nairobi. Uh, the second region was Himalayas, climate change in mountain regions had a lot to do with glaciers, as you would not be surprised. That's what's happening about climate change in that, in that region. And uh, met in Kathmandu, West Africa, it was a very special group. And the theme uh, was climate change and women and gender and climate change. Um, had our colleagues in Ghana host us. And Southeast Asia was held in Bangkok. And um, watersheds was the theme that emerged from that group. Um, the, uh, the, the way that I organize these workshops is I crowdsource actually the agenda. There's sort of a framework and different modules, but this is another sort of participatory ap aspect of mapping out actually the agenda for these workshops that happen afterwards. So uh, sort of the results of this, that they really improved their research skills better than they were expecting to, but more importantly, we were surprised how much really those professional skills, the communication mattered. Uh, so we picked 14 of them, brought them to DC, were received by Charlie Bolden at NASA and also Dr. Shaw at uh, USAID, and they got to practice their two minutes on NASA television. I had my two minutes too, but obviously I can't keep to time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will very quickly, my last two minutes, talk about uh, um, the education kind of component of learning objectives and how that mapping technology and mapping techniques can really also uh, meet the goals of education and climate change. This was funded by the State Department. We had 120 secondary students this past summer uh, in Bolivia, South Africa, and Panama. They were 10-day camps. Uh, we took them out in the field. They did a lot of field work. They also learned how to do GPS and, and media. Uh, took them back into the lab, uh, learning how to do those cloud computing and telling story maps with the GIS story maps, if you're familiar with those. They, are, they all put their teams together. Uh, in, in these story maps that were then presented at the end with what State Department called Tech Torrent, which were storms of uh, results about what climate change is going on from the youth perspective there, often with dignitaries and media. Uh, there was La Paz, Bolivia, uh, South Africa, where vulnerability was the key theme. In Panama, it just so happened that we, our campsite had severe water contamination, which was a logistical problem, but a great research uh, opportunity <laughs> and uh, made the front page of the national paper because it was very timely. I could not resist putting in Texas Tech in there who uh, we realized that it was pretty ironic all this traveling so we did some carbon offsetting tree planting activities <laughs> uh, which the president of Panama actually appreciated as well. Uh, but the main thing that really matters is the, the learning objectives. We were able to really increase the self-efficacy and confidence in technology, knowledge, and cultural sensitivity across the board for all of these kids. But my um, favorite result was that the girls before, there was a statistical difference between the girls and boys and afterwards that did not exist. So the optimization of that process of mapping together has a key role in being able to achieve everyone's participation and I have a lot of people to thank for helping make that happen. All right, that was fascinating. Questions? Ken. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, I think in terms of mapping like the Ogallala and how more sophisticated it has become compared to the uh, different, uh, just how far we can see in and, and represent that. But I, I, I wonder if the more sophisticated the maps are, the more they tell, if that reduces uncertainty and conflict or it, or if it, if it has any effect. I mean, you should be able to look at those maps of the Ogallala and say, yes, in fact, this is a serious problem. But some people would still say it isn't, and they still want to, they still want to reserve some sense of belief that there's something we're not seeing. Um, yeah. And that the maps even, you know, they get more and more sophisticated, but they, they don't tell all. You know? that's, that's really true. And that's why I, I think it's important to remember that it, mapping is a process and not just the final product. That, who is the one making the map? And where is the data coming from? And what other kinds of information should be interrogated with those? I mean, you can definitely map the depth of the, or the 
increasing depth of the aquifer, but then what really matters about that? And how can you put that over, I mean, I think it would be very exciting, and I'm sure there have been research to do it, how does that correspond to people's perceptions mm -hmm. about what is going on where they are? And does, do those maps kind of coincide? And sort of crowdsourcing those, those mm -hmm. thoughts about that with respect to you know, the other scientific kinds of information. I think that's kind of the powerful thing about the technologies that we can now layer those kinds of things and come up with all sorts of really interesting new questions. And um, in terms of the uncertainty problem, I don't think, I really think that that's a, a communication issue, discourse issue, and I, I don't think that's a, uh, it's not one of those solvable problems. I think it's something that is just addressed. And the more participation that uh, can be generated around that, I think that, that um, struggle, that challenge, uh, is is met better by more participation. Okay. Interesting connection between the two different talks. Other questions? I still have one follow-up oh, if nobody else has a question. And that <laughs> is, uh, like you, you see these maps, the political maps, are very telling. Is to say, here's the U.S., just the 50 states and blue, red and blue states, and then you break it down by county, break it down by, and pretty soon it just becomes a say sort of a web of. of intersecting purple instead of red or blue and you would look at that and say well it, it's intractable I mean you know half of me may, may be Republican half of me may be Democrat and maybe that it may be come down to that level of, of intractability and, and so we don't you know have to, in a way that that map it's it's stymie decision making if you're a politician looking at those how do you know what to do you know yeah a very good question. Uh, what scale you're looking at and what resolution you're looking at, um, you know, there's a big difference when you when you color all of Texas red and, <laughs> and versus looking at, you know, like a dot map, the population, the um, population center's dot map of, of each individual person represented on a map looks way different mm -hmm. and where, way more refined in that, in that question. So those decision-making processes about making maps I think parallel the decision-making process is, is that we go through as scientists, especially when we're working with interdisciplinary colleagues, we have to make those decisions at some point, and we have to render them visible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think every research project does go through that. I think it just is maybe more uh, uh, in your face when you're having to deal with it and placing it on the map and making it visible. Those right, so kinds of questions. You have, to, you have to course grain. And you say, well, yeah. for, for our purposes of decision-making, Lubbock is all red or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.